writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. In this episode, the Right Pack is going to talk about the power and the joy of imagination and creation. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things. Things are moving along, actually. I'm finally done working on characters. Enough for now, anyway. After, well, I'll go ahead and share this because I know Kathleen will kick me if I don't. After over 91,000 words on characters alone, I'm finally starting the actual story and probably already written, wrote the first chapter, which will be cut. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how, how long did it take you to do those 91 some odd thousand words? Yeah, uh, it was definitely like three months, right? No, no, actually it was faster than that. It was much was faster. it six months? I thought it was like seven. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, no, don't, please don't hate me. Please, please don't hate me when I say that, that the, well, the 1,000 words took longer to write than the 90,000 words because 90,000 words were done in two and a half weeks. Yeah, um, but none of those are going to get printed. Yeah, none of those are printed. Those are all <laughs> just for me to know my characters. Mm. Um, I want video of this, because I believe like you're either moving faster than humanly possible, <laughs> or maybe there's smoke rising from your fingers. Yeah. Yeah. We need video of this. Wait, wait, and I, and what I need to do is put on the soundtrack to the old Bionic Man TV show as I'm typing. <laughs> of course, that means I have to slow down my typing speed, so... <laughs> And that's the real reason why you had to get a new keyboard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I wish that was a reason. Okay, anyway, and I am also a voice actor, and Winding Trails Media will be coming out with some audiobooks in the very near future. Um, so I we will have examples of my voice acting on there. Um, also, too, please visit www.davidallenlucas.com. That's David, A-L-A-N. Lucas.com, and you can actually listen to my samples if you hit, or my demos if you hit my um, voice actor link. It will take you there. Um, if you get spooked with the kid animation slash computer voices, don't blame me. That actually means I did my, did my job well. Okay, enough about me. Along with me today is my lovely co-host. Hello, everyone. My name is Kathleen Kayembe. I write speculative fiction under my own name. You can find stories by me at nightmare-magazine.com, um, lightspeedmagazine.com, and okafrica.com. You can also find one of those stories in the Best Science Fiction and Fantasy of the Year, Volume 12, edited by Jonathan Strahan, so be looking out for that. And uh, when I'm not writing speculative fiction under my own name, or running writing workshop groups, or editing, I am writing paranormal romance and other forms of romance, I suppose I should admit, under the pen name Kaseka and Vita. Which is spelled because none of us sit around this room. You're are, not Congolese? Or Congolese, okay. unfortunately, All right. for you. Alright, so that is K-A-S-E-K-A, -E and the new word, N-V-I-T-A. Also, too, GatewayCon 2018, Kathleen is running some very special courses for our write-ins. For the... Um, Writing getaway, so stay tuned. Writing for, retreat. Writing retreat, thank you. Um, you can learn more eventually uh, at www.stlwritersguild.org. Get away to Gateway Con. Yes. <laughs> and also with us today is... Hi, my name is Chanel A. Chan. I write uh, science fiction and fantasy, and I go on literary benders, almost like hangovers. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. And also with us is the air captain of steampunk himself, uh, Brad R. Cook. I, as uh, Dave said, I am the author of uh, many a steampunk thing. Uh, do check out the Iron Chronicles, uh, which is for your like young adult. It's complete. The series is complete. Do check out that trilogy. Also, though, if you're looking to get a young steampunker, uh, you know, well into the genre... Check out my latest, which is uh, Steam Tree, The Airdranium Adventures, which is a middle grade, 
And uh, if you're at all curious about what this stuff is, uh, I have a brand new series, uh, and check it out. It is uh, the first episode is free, so to speak, and you can find it. It's called Tar Tales of the Gear Blade, and you can find it at bradrcook.com. Also with us today is the mistress of mayhem and murder herself. Vidora Amos, I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And I have just finished one book and am about to launch off on another, for which I plan to go to Portugal in the spring. Well, in March, anyway. That's going to be one heck of a tax write-off. Ah, I don't know <laughs> about that, but sure, I sure hope that uh, I have a good time. I plan to. I'm also president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. Excellent. And rounding out the list... Uh, List are two more people. I'm Melanie Lucas. I am working very slowly on a <laughs> yes, somebody's nodding uh, on a, a a fantasy novel. And I suppose I in real in the time that we are recording this, I have less than a week to finalize questions to ask at a New Year's party because we're recording in the past to mm -hmm. ask people about their experiences after World War II. Mm -hmm. right. so. That's really cool. cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what Melanie always fails to include is she's also got her name on several, or on multiple science papers that are out there. They just aren't print, they aren't published for like science fiction, they are real science. They count. Yeah. Oh, yes, they count. Mm -hmm. And also, the man who likes to play the Game of Thrones with his own books. <laughs> I don't know if I'm that thick, but I, I did live in New Mexico for a time, so I do share that with uh, uh, Martin. Um, I am Ryan P. Freeman. I write fantasy. Uh, I write high fantasy, especially. Um, I also provide author services, so if you're interested in indie publishing or you want to pick with marketing, I can help you out. Um, but um, I have... I'll have at least two new books coming out in 2018, so look for them. Uh, all the information you can find on ryanpfreeman.com. Excellent. So I think we need to acknowledge our... Yeah, we also, our have, <laughs> we also have something in the background known as Pumpkin the Plot Cat, who is causing lots of trouble. So if you hear any sounds, that's really on him. Okay, so the power and joy of creation. Imagination. Of imagination. We're I do. I, topic title right. Don't worry. Yeah, I eventually get my own topic title correct. Uh, Just sing it like it's a uh, Willy Wonka song. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually want people to listen. If they hear me sing, then the CIA will take that, and the Department of Defense will take my voice <laughs> and use it as a weapon of mass destruction. I still need to hear this voice, but let's go on. Yes, please do. Um, so we are all creators. We all use our imagination. I would say everybody listening to us is the same way. We creators are, are people who create anything, be it writing, art, architecture, etc. We're unique of the whole world. We're not we're not the ones we're the ones who are gonna leave a mark. So but it's not easy. It's never been easy. Why do you keep on writing? What what gives you joy in what you write? Why do you? What moves you past where you are by using your imagination? What makes you unique? And I'll start off with Ryan. Um, my big thing is wonder. When I find moments in my life where I'm, I'm experiencing legitimate wonder, I feel like whenever I eventually get back to my my. Uh, uh, my house or my local digs where I write, those memories and those experiences are in my mind and they help fuel my writing, keep it fresh and, and I don't know, like exciting for me, you know? Um, and I found that the more and more experiences that I can pull up in my mind of times and moments where I've experienced real wonder, um, I feel like I can write better stories. Anybody else? Um, oh, this topic's kind of. Sorry, you were gonna say something, Brad. 
Oh, uh, well, I don't know if I'm really going to add to this much. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, we all use our imagination. I think, you know, as you were saying, we're the creators and such. Uh, it's, you know, imagination is what kind of our whole job is about. I mean, we're wordsmiths, and that's the other part that our job is. Uh, but especially because most of us are genre writers, uh, we sit around and either come up with you know, murder mysteries or romances or high fantasy with elves and crazy, you know, knights and stuff or crazy airship pirates in my case. Um, so it's it's really just about how we use it, but I think we all kind of get to play and enjoy in that everlasting childment wonderment thing. I think that it all boils down really to what if... I'll tell you a little yes. story. I was at the uh, Jazz at the Bistro Club in the bar part uh, talking with some friends about uh, the upcoming concert that we're going to see in a few minutes. And in that place, they have some very odd looking chairs. It kind of a uh, crescent chair with a weird back. And my friend, who is not exactly tiny, said, I don't even know how to sit in that thing. And I said, well, I, it has a lot of options, if you ask me. You could kind of lie in it. You could turn it around and face the other way. And she said, stop, stop. You never turn it off, do you? And I think that's what imagination is all about. Writers have imagination that just goes out of control and sometimes comes out their mouth or out their fingers, and it's a relief when it happens. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, and I would I would second that. It, trying to shut off your imagination if you are a writer, at least my personal experience for all that's worth, it hurts. It can hurt you badly. Um, I've talked about in the past when I, I had to put aside all my writing, put everything aside, and I know some people in here were there where I finally just broke down. It, it really absolutely hurts to try to shut it off. Which I think is different. I, th I know everybody has imagination. Duh. Everybody, at least should, have imagination that's on this earth. Um, but it's that's what we do big, with it. That's a big should. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is a big should. But no, honestly, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, point. Sir Ken Robinson would say, everybody is born with imagination and we're trained out of it as children and through school. So uh, those are some TED Talks you should totally watch those. Look up <laughs> Sir Ken Robinson, guys. Um... But I was going to say, like, when I, when I write, when I exercise my imagination, um, I, uh, I feel healthier. I feel more like myself, and I feel more present in the world. And um, people have, studies have shown that people who journal the facts of their life with the feelings that they felt about those things are actually healthier than people who don't. So, I mean, like, there's, writing is good for you. The other thing, though, like... I, I come from a very creative family who is not creative in the same way as I am. So, like, when someone will bring up something and I'll just let loose with all the different what-if possibilities from the perfectly benign question they ask, they look at me like, why are you like this? I don't understand why you had to go into werewolves when I asked <laughs> about the tea in the cabinet. Like, I don't know. It's fun, though. I love being around other writers and people who are creative in similar ways that I am because like group brainstorms are the most fun like I keep going back to this but how many bodies can you fit in a walk-in closet is a great icebreaker question to pose to a group of writers it really is yeah and I'm sitting here giggling because I'm remembering or chuckling I'm remembering when the right pack started off before the right pack long before this podcast and Kathleen knows this one we were at a coffee shop that had a giant blackboard in a private, kind of a private little room that we had stolen. And they loved um, us. <laughs> I was working on a murder mystery at the time. And I had turned that chalkboard into my murder board. I mean, I had all the suspects, I had the methods down, I was writing down all the characters, the locations, the different methods of murder. And in walks the barista, carrying in my coffee, stopped. Mouth agape, eyes wide, and hands shaking. <laughs> we and I think it was Jen who's not here today. Goes, it's okay. It's only for a story. <laughs> so, 
along with that, I'm going to ask, I'm going to say something and then I'm going to ask a question as I add to a little meme to that. I'm going to, so first off, one of the things about imagination and writing, period, and I'm, I'm, Ray Bradbury said this about science fiction, but you know what, I'm going to say this about all different levels of writing, and that is, it is in writing, it is in the storytelling that the philosopher is truly free to roam and view the world. Okay, I certainly have two things up, so I'm going to hold for the rest of where I was going with that, and I'm going to let these two go, and then I'm going to say. <laughs> well, I, they're fighting uh, over who, who's going to go first. Oh my gosh, it's a politeness fight. Who will win by losing? Okay, um, I was just going to say, like, we're discussing the power and the joy of imagination mm -hmm. and like we could go into all the things that require imagination that make our world a better place but i want to talk about the joy a bit because we talk a lot about how hard it is to make a living to make it as a writer let me, let, talk me let me pause you. you you're going exactly where i wanted to so let me read this meme and then i'm gonna let you go all right so this is a meme that came from the writer's circle a while back on facebook and I don't know about you guys, but I feel like this actually hits me right in the um, abdomen, shall we say. Um, lying in bed, constructs perfect plot. Standing in the shower, constructs perfect characters. While driving, constructs perfect setting. Sitting at the blank page. What are words? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well... I, I think we do talk a lot about, you know, how much work you have to put in to make it as a writer and how you probably won't end up as a Stephen King or J.K. Rowling no matter how much work you put in because we're just not all that lucky in the right place at the right time on top of the work that we're doing. But, like, writing is not something that generally people pick up because they hate it. Writers start out writing because it does something for them that they love, that they like, that gives them joy and energy and just makes them happy. And I mean, that's at the root of why I'm a writer, because it makes me happy. Um, I love coming up with things. Mm -hmm. I love feeling like I got like blindsided by the spirit that is writing with the giant plot that needs to be put down. And does it suck sometimes when I'd like to be doing other things? Yes. But as soon as I start, I don't care about those other things. And like, when I finally stop and I remember I was supposed to have eaten three hours ago and also my stomach stopped growling two hours ago because it finally gave up, I'm still okay with that because writing was fun enough and wonderful enough for me that it's okay. Uh, I guess Melanie. Yeah. Um, then I've got funny. Chanel and then Ryan. Something my mom said years ago, but she was an adult. This is when she went to a, just realized there were community college classes. She was an adult and actually had a college degree and was going... But, um, so, you know, I was an adult at the time, and she said, yeah, I never realized, you know, you could go to a class and improve your skills for fictional writing. And, uh, see, back in the day when she went to college, this was, uh, computers existed. You had these things called index cards, and it was just after, you know where bugs came from in computers? Because actually bugs would get in computers. That was her era. Computers took up an entire room. They were down to one size room. Running one program, you, to write a computer program, you wrote it out longhand, mm -hmm. you typed it on a manual typewriter, and then you made punch cards. Then you brought in these index boxes full of punch cards and had someone else run them. Hidden figures! Yes. That's what they were learning how to do in yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Exactly. Yes. I know what you're going what they were doing. Okay. But the point is, this was well before spell check. Her first English class, she got a C. <clears throat> you know why she got a C? Because of spelling. If you got more than two spelling errors in an assignment, you failed the grammar and punctuation part of it. So she would get an A for content, F for that, and you know, and she just saw the C and the F didn't see the A for creativity, so she just kind of grave up on creative writing. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. point is, going back as adult, she realized, hey, there are classes that can help on that. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Kathleen, you do a dovetail, then we still got Chanel and Ryan. I was just going to say, like, with 
computers being the way they are now, it's easier than ever to become a writer oh, God, or yes. to, and to get your work out there. And I think that's marvelous. Like, mm -hmm. uh, more Let's, people being creative is always going to be a good thing in my book. Let's circle back to that topic in a minute. I like that one. Let's go back to Chanel and then Ryan, and then we're going to come back to that one. Okay. I kind of love the Grinch here because I'm like, it's, um, it's all, haha, <laughs> Christmas is mine. Um, <laughs> It's all well and good to be able to have creativity and be able to um, be able to come up with all these scenarios and all these what ifs. It's wonderful and entertaining and so much fun. However, being writers, we have to be able to do more than that. Yes, we do. You got to be able to take that create that impetus of creativity and whittle it down to something that makes sense. So. Yeah. Well, mostly makes sense. I was going to say, uh-oh, Chanel can't go work in Hollywood now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, oh, make no. It. They make sense. They're just dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, I guess my God. question would be, how do, you, how do you take that creativity and, like, sort of smash it down into this box? I hate the word box. But, like, um, smash it down and make it a story. How do you smash it down and make it... A, a, a murder mystery or a romance or something like that. How do you take your creativity? Like, what process do you go through to take your creativity, this giant thing, and make it into this book? Okay, well, let me, before we get going with that one, you said it's something else that writers are really having to do more than what they used to have to do. Or at least maybe that's, maybe that's a romance side of it. But, and I don't mean romance as far as the genre, I'm talking about the romantic aspect of the writer. Modern day writers, thanks to the internet and all that, have got to be creative in almost every area of, I know people are going to have a shock when I say this word, the business <gasps> of writing. How to, how to market, how to get your books out there, where how to get the word out there. And it, it takes creativity to a new level because, a painful level, because you're not always the best in those areas. But yet you've spent all this time taking a huge idea, like you were just kind of sort of hinting at, and drilling it down to a single book, short story, poem, something. So, um, Ryan, do you mind? I've got another dovetail here by Kathleen into this one, and then... It's fine. So, I have written an equation on my little notebook that I have for each episode of Right Pack. Imagination plus craft equals communicated story. And I think all of those words are important because you start with the imagined story and like the imagined story is always perfect and wonderful and the written story is never gonna match up because I mean, failings of language. Yes. Um, and then you add craft, writing craft. So how you tell stories, like how structure works, what word choice you're gonna use, like how point of view works, how not to confuse people with point of view, things like that. And when you jam all those together in a not a box, because you don't like the word box, <laughs> you end up with a story. And if your craft is on point, you have communicated that story well. Because writing is about communication. And one of the things that I wish schools were more able to do in this world of standardized testing was teach kids how to communicate clearly through writing so that writing is not an impediment to whatever's in their imagination. Like, I think the best thing you can do as a writer is get comfortable with communicating through writing because then you're not impeded when you have this wonderful idea. You, you can just start writing and your brain has already figured out how to tell the story for you. Like, the more tools you give your subconscious, the less work you have to do as a writer to communicate the story that is being down to you from on high. I'd agree with that. Right? And then over here, Ryan. Oh, Ryan is frozen. I'm going to move on to <laughs> All right, Fedora pass on Felipe. and okay. then come back to Ryan, hopefully. I think writers get an adrenaline rush or endomorphins or whatever it is that gives one great pleasure at certain moments while writing. That is why I know I can lose myself in writing a scene and when I finish it or when I look up at the clock, hour has gone by. No problem. Carly Simon, who was a songwriter, well, she still is alive, I said she's still alive, 
Uh, she wrote, you're so vain, and uh, the spy who loved me, oh. or whatever it was, and James Bond. <coughs> yeah. And anyway, she said that nothing gives her greater pleasure in life, nothing, than finding the exact right word, the exactly perfect rhyme in a song. And we get that often. Isn't it a wonderful thing? Okay, Kathleen, and then Ryan, we lost you, so I'm coming back to you. What you described is a state of flow. Yes. Like, yeah. that's that's the closest humans can be to to perfect, I think. When you're in a state of flow, that is that is what you want to be doing for your life. If you can achieve that, do that thing as much as you can, and try and get paid for it. Ryan? <laughs> can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Now I can't. <laughs> oh, wow, we are having problems with the internet, which is how uh, Ryan attends. Either um, that or he's faking it. What do you think? I don't think he's faking it. He's not be really good at the mannequin challenge. Yeah. <laughs> he'll be asleep. <laughs> no, he's, His eyes are open. Yeah, yep. I'm back. back. Ryan, are you guys, back? guys, you back? We're good. We're good. We're good. For now, go for it. Speak it fast. Speak it fast. <laughs> no, I really liked what Kathleen said in the beginning uh, about how you have to like your work uh, um, because. Right now, I'm in the process of chopping up my main word, brain spell, first volume into like a series, an episodic series. And you know what? As I'm rereading it to make sure it's all there, I really like it. And, and this is, you know, I, I wrote it years ago now. And so part of who I'm writing for is, is myself. I mean, yeah, I get inspiration from other people. But when you're able to, to write a story that years later, you know, you've almost, as you're reading through it, you're like, did I write this? Um, a story that you that you like. Um, I think that's something to be said. I think one of the goals as a writer is to write something that honestly you you're proud of, that you like, that's that's you on a page, uh, um, in some form of a genre or a story, because you have something to share. And I've always found that to be I don't know kind of like personally inspiring because when I go back off ten, it's like there's no way I wrote this like. <laughs> I know what I write like, and it's not like this. Um, I don't know. It just kind of buoys me up sometimes when I need it. Kathleen? I had a good time going back and reading stories that I wrote. Like, from a, like, okay, let me rephrase that. Like, after high school, I have a fun time going back and rereading those stories. Um, and uh, something that I, I just... For people who are like me who will start a lot of things and not finish most of them because that is part of how we enjoy writing i just i just need to let you know that if you are that kind of person do yourself a favor for when you are future you is coming back to reread those just put like a paragraph summarizing where you thought the story was going to go <laughs> just oh, yes. like you will you will be thanking yourself 10 years from from whenever you write that little summary because you will have gone back and you'd be like, yes, I like this story. I should definitely continue that. Wait, it just ends here? Where was I going with this? Oh my gosh, it's in the novel category. Where was I going with this? Like there's a chapter, where was I go? Oh. So just do yourself a favor. Tell yourself where you're going. Brett, I completely agree. <coughs> it is wonderful to go back and read. I actually, you're like, you know, post high school. I, I have stuff from elementary school that is um, painfully written, let's just call it that. <laughs> yes, that is, that is why I high school. But some of what is there is so beautiful, and it's like, yeah, that was that little writer mind at work, you know, that was like coming up with good ideas even in like fourth grade or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there is some fun to going back and reading, you know, kind of checking out some of those old stories. I happen to benefit that um, my creative writing teacher in elementary school uh, made books for us every year. Mm. And that's actually kind of what got me started in this whole thing. So I have those little books, um, you know, that we, we had, you know, that I still have to this day. And they're awesome and it's a nostalgia factor. They are not awesomely written nor are they awesomely story told. It's crafted. Um, but basically what I was going to get into is the fact that uh, I consider myself a storyteller. Uh, in, in the oldest traditions, I guess you would say. Uh, I have actually told stories verbally and stuff to like kids in classrooms as a storyteller for years. Um, but because of that, like that really does affect the way that I write 
And I almost less so, you know, you're talking about the joy of writing all these words, and, and that's actually more the struggly part for me. Uh, but the story itself, and going back and rereading these stories and all that kind of stuff, that's the pure joy for me. Uh, I love rereading some of my old work and some of like the stuff that I've written and published because, yes, I see the flaws, and I can generally tell you how many flaws are in each of the published stories that I have out right now. Um, but I can also now see past that and see the actual joy of the, the, the thread of the story that is there, and in so far of everything I've published, I'm really happy with that. So that's kind of the, for me, the, the joy side of all of this. Yeah, I was just thinking about the stuff that's written or half written, so this actually harks back to Kathleen. There's one story that I really hope gets finished one day. I believe it's called Skittles. <gasps> I hope that gets finished too! <laughs> Uh, David, what is Skittles? Uh, okay. For those listeners, not I'm for no, Skittles is around. Sk but Skittles is based on well, was Skittles was here. Skittles earlier. is physically based on my own cat, uh, pumpkin, the plot cat. But and you can find the story up to where I got it finished at. About oh, chapter thirteen. Somewhere around there, um, episode thirteen. It was being written episodically. Um, just write Skittles the. First cat on Mars? Yes, first cat on Mars, I think is what it was. He's still on uh, Earth, by the way. Yeah, he's still on... The, the goal was to get him onto Mars eventually. What it is, it, it came to me as a concept and a dream that I decided to play with. And that was... If you ever watched Star Trek The Next Generation, Data had a cat. Data's cat constantly kept getting changed. <laughs> Makes you wonder what happened to it. You know, escaped the room and got in the teleporter and oops, slight mistake. But anyway. It changed genders, too. It changed oh. genders. It changed... Breeds. For breeds, you name it. Um, I was wondering, like, did it change forms? What do you mean change? But this answers my question. Yeah. Go on. So, it just something about that kicked in, and it's like, okay, I firmly believe and pray and hope we will get the hell off of Earth and expand into the solar system and beyond. Because to quote somebody... Um, it was a Russian scientist, I believe, that said, Earth is a cradle of, of mankind, but one, but one cannot stay in the cradle forever. So, with that, I was like, okay, humanity. Humanity is going to take pets with them. Eventually, that is going to happen. What would it be like to have a cat go to Mars? What would it be like for a cat in zero gravity? <laughs> Etc. <cetera>, yeah. <laughs> And my mind started doing exactly so what Chanel just did, was start chuckling. And all that led to me writing a story, an episodic story that never got finished, um, about Skittles, the, cat, the first cat on Mars. Which would make a great audiobook. Written from the cat's point of view, which makes it even more fun. Um, and actually, I got inspired. I can't think of the name of the author, unfortunately, but it is... He, he wrote a story, a series of stories about a P.I. And it was written from the P.I.'s dog's point of view. And so it's like, okay, this could be fun to play with. Maybe someday I'll get back to it. I, I, I'm being hit over the head with it. So um, I'm going to go to Fedora, and then I've got a question for everybody. Yeah, I think it's possible, as you were suggesting in a way, to grow the imagination, to stretch it. And one of the ways that you can go about that, I think, is sort of a cross-pollination with other arts. Mm -hmm. One of the most famous poems ever written is John Keats' Ode on a Grecian Urn, in which he saw a Grecian urn from thousands of years earlier in a museum, and he looked at it and tried to imagine what it all meant to the person who created this lovely work of art. So by examining other works of art, often we come up with some interesting ideas of our own and an inspiration from it. And that's of course not the only place, but it is a good place I think to start. Look at the Mona Lisa and how many people have been inspired by that, and songs and you name it. So that looking at other kinds of art and other artistic endeavors is a good place to grow your imagination. Nature is another. Mm -hmm. So why not? Why not try some of these methods? 
and see if they will uh, increase the imagination that you say was quenched in school. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but I'm going to jump that one because not only just view it, be part of that art. Um, one of the things that's been helping me get back on the writing road has been my voice acting. And how did I do that? With some improv comedy. Me doing comedy is kind of scary, but I pulled it off. I haven't done that much of it, but what I'm finding as I do voice acting, I'm sorry, let me stop. I was having trouble with some of my voice acting. I was early, I never did acting classes, and my voice coach was like, yeah, you need to get into improv for a little bit. I'm like, I, I, I am so picky on comedy, it's not funny. I have people who recommend comedy shows to me, and I go, yeah, I barely made it to the first commercial. Um, because I couldn't stand them. And yet I found that, and if you ever do improv, you find yourself being forced into being a character all the time, different characters. And somehow that had translated to my voice, voiceover, and then that translated back to the writing. Don't ask me how, but I felt the blockages being broken. And speaking of blockages, I don't want to talk about writer's block. I want to talk about the blockages of society with writing. And I've got to look for my wife going, what are you talking about? So let me make this very easy. Writing is something you love to do, I hope. It is probably an insanity, if you think about it. Because what are you giving up when you write? You're giving up time. Time you could be doing something else. Spending it with your friends. Your friends are contacting, hey, let's head down to, let's go sing karaoke. Let's go catch this movie. Let's go get together for a barbecue. Family doing the same thing. Um, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's used to be my favorite time to write because of, well, my previous job, I barely got time to do it, so I took advantage of it. And, um, yeah, and people are like, it, we, we should be getting together for Thanksgiving dinner. No, I'm busy in Chapter 4. You've got bills to pay. As sad as it is, and maybe you are still, I'm talking to the audience out there, you're still working at a bill pay job and you're trying to break into writing. Well, that's extra hours that you could be doing something else. And I'm sure somebody along the line is telling you, why don't you just go for a nine to five job? Go become a corporate, corporate little bot. I mean, you it's, have the nine to five job. Right? You might have a nine to five job. But that's all you need. You, you don't you don't need to be a writer. You don't need to be this creator. Just be a little bot. How do you guys get past that? What is it about the power of your imagination and the joy of what you're doing get you past that? Now we'll start off with Ryan. Um, honestly, and this is, I'm really glad you brought that up because it's something that I'm struggling with right right now. Um, people people a lot of people where I live still don't see my choice to be a writer as a legitimate profession. Um, and the, the big thing that I've been doing so far right now to kind of push through that is to try to surround myself with with, with other writers like you guys, with, with other people that I know um, that, that are going through the same thing. Um, because I need, I need other people to, to what I'm doing, to, to not just believe in it, but, but assume that it's legitimate. You know, they don't have to be persuaded or, or whatever. They're like, oh, yeah, of course. Um, because what I'm writing isn't going to come out if, if I'm kind of struggling with the doubt or with, you know, the lack of encouragement. Uh, I don't think that I could continue to be a writer without a writing community. I would agree with you. And with what Kathleen said earlier, she talked about how the school beats it out of us, basically. I don't think she used those words, but I will use those words with great glee. And I think society does that, too. So, please continue. Kathleen. Oh, well, society's not... In society, I can't say that. American society is not terribly supportive of writers. Um... Even though a lot of our communication is done through writing, we don't pay writers very well. We don't say, oh, that's not like your kid's like, I want to be a writer. Cool. What's your day job? Because you can't, you can't make a living as a writer. Mm -hmm. Like that's something that we get told all the time. And I mean, my day job is a subsidy for the arts job. It's how I can 
right when I get home and it takes a lot out of you and we're not great as a society about that but like communities and the internet especially have been really helpful for me at least in allowing me to not just express my creativity but inspiring me to be more creative um i used to be on live journal before it got taken over by russia and people started migrating off in droves and i was so prolific when i was on live journal because i had a writing community there and we all like to write and we all read each other's writing and left comments and fostered that kind of atmosphere of encouragement and it's been hard not having that sort of thing. And some friends and I are doing that on Dream With now, um, trying to get back into the old habits that made us more creative and productive. But I mean, writers are not, writing itself is generally a solitary act, but writers are communal people for, from my experience. Like we need inspiration. And that comes from experiencing life through other people's eyes and being around people who are just as creative and off the wall as we are. Like, I, I met a group of people who were geeky through the internet and we all got together to go watch a Captain America movie and the woman sitting next to me was a writer but I didn't know about any of the rest of the group. And then she, she asked a question about how to kill a supervillain when you only had like this, this, and this power, this superpower. How would you take down a supervillain who does this and this and this? And the entire table erupted with ideas. That supervillain was dead 17 times over <laughs> in three minutes. And I was like, my people. I have found my people. It was super inspiring. And I, I try and surround myself with people like that. But like, as writers, that's something you need. The kind of person around you who inspires you. Anyone else want to take a swing at this? That was lovely. Thank you. Should I drop the mic? The mic is suspended. I'm no, please don't drop the mic. It's too darn expensive. I literally have to get up to do that. Yes, I, just, I know. I just don't much. want you to do that. It's too much. I'm a writer. I sit down and write. I don't <laughs> stand up and write. So, what, what about anybody else? What, what keeps you going despite everything? Caffeine. Yes, caffeine is important. <laughs> we will not talk about my coffee consumption as, when it gets up there. Um, lately it's been good, but yeah, I will say that years ago I was drinking 10 pots of coffee a day. Good night. Yeah, that was... No, not a good night. <laughs> <laughs> plus tea, plus soda. I can't drink soda anymore out of all that. That's the odd thing. Um, let's go with Fedora, then get back to Kathleen. Well, as far as I'm concerned, writing is always new. I mean, you yeah. have routines for all kinds of things in your life when to cook and when to make the beds and this and that and the other. Raking the yard, you know, there is stuff to do, there are chores to do, but they're the same chores every time. There's not a lot of creativity in mowing the same damn lawn the same way every week. But in writing, even though you have a block of time that you use every day to do writing, which is what I do, it's always different because the story you're telling, the scene you're creating, is always different. So there is a variety in that, a production in that, a going from here to somewhere else in that, that is always important and always rewarding. Even if you feel frustrating at the end of it, it's still rewarding. Okay, Kathleen and then Ryan. Well, uh, Ryan, did you have a dovetail or? Uh, no, I just, it, I won't. Sort of with this, I guess. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, my my big thing to keep me going right now has been uh, I alternate to a different a couple different writing locations, um, and by expose myself to different atmospheres, kind of I feel like I'm a bit of an action arc. Like wherever I am, I kind of suck in wherever I am. So I'll go down to this local brewery that I like. Uh, shout out to Mark Twain Brewery, or I'll go to uh, Electric Fountain Brewery, which is a coffee house in Quincy. Uh, or there's a couple other places, but each one has its own atmosphere, its own vibe, and so that kind of works its way in, in my writing and helps fuel me to keep going. Chanel? Uh, that's a hard question. Because I feel like, uh, depending on the project, um, the, what, keeps it, what keeps me going about that project changes. 
because there can be times where I'm just like, I am so done with seeing this girl trapes like going around this freaking castle. I'm about to light this whole thing on fire. Like it, it, it it's not, <laughs> it's not really the story itself that keeps me going. Whereas other times it's like, I want to know what happens. So I keep writing it. I'm a, I'm a pantser. So I don't, I don't know what happens until I write it. But, um, it, it, one of the things that I did notice though, is that like when it comes to what Kathleen would call flow, like when you hit that sweet spot of just glory, it, it, it doesn't become an option to stop. It, it's not for me and people, I guess, like me, there's not an option to stop. This story is going to come out and you're going to write like your soul's on fire the entire time. It, 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 it's possibly uh, certifiable, but it, it's a method to, I don't know, I'm, I'm babbling, but it, it works for me. <laughs> in the zone. You're in, you're in the, the zone. zone. <laughs> Kathleen and then Brad. Well, uh, I find it quite helpful when I'm, when I'm living around other writers too, because like, I live with a writer right now. It's pretty fabulous. If I get back to the house and she's writing, I'm like, oh, I should do that thing. So I will generally start writing within like 30 minutes. Um, so that's been nice. And that's why I got as far on NaNo as I did, because I was living with a writer who was also doing NaNo. So shout out to that and shout out to uh, David and Melanie, who are married and are both writers. So, I mean, you built that in. That's pretty fabulous. I just Unfortunately, he tends to write in the basement. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when he's in the basement, you know, you know, he's probably writing. Yeah. I guess I should be writing. And so that you have the entire first floor. To yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I wanted to, to go back to something Fedora said, though, earlier about stretching your imagination. Um, I think that's super important to do as a as a writer and as a creative person to stretch yourself and kind of see where else you can go. Um, ways that you can do that are just always be learning new things, like picking up new skills, reading about interesting topics, watching nature shows. Like there, there's a movie called Attack the Block that is absolutely fabulous. And I swear to you, they got the idea from watching a nature show because the <laughs> nature show it's an alien invasion movie, and the nature show that I bet they got it from is literally playing on the TV during one of the scenes. But you don't pay attention to that because it's irrelevant, except it is the movie. And I was so shocked, but it was fabulous. So I mean, like, nature shows about moths can give you ideas about alien invasions. That's pretty fabulous. Mm -hmm. Also, writing prompts are good. And, um, and you mentioned Fedora getting inspiration from other mediums. And collaborations with other mediums are also pretty cool yep. and with other artists. So recommend that. Also recommend um, Austin Cleone's book, Steal Like an Artist. He goes into mm -hmm. the ways that other art inspires us. And it's a short book, really fast read, highly recommended. Yep. If you have a quick dovetail, go for it. If you have a dovetail, go for it, Chanel. Um, one thing that I would add, it would just be pay attention. Like just, just go out into the world Take yourself out of it, figuratively speaking, and watch. Just look around and you will find something that's inspiring. You will find something that you've never seen before. You'll find something that you can juxtapose with something that you've been um, thinking about. Like for example, I was driving through my hometown and I saw a cemetery and I saw a really weird looking headstone that looked like a, looked like a throne and I'm like, who puts a throne in the cemetery? And from there, this entirely wonderful, I think it's wonderful, um, <laughs> <laughs> plot, er like, er <laughs> so literally just be observant. You will find something to inspire you. Just quickie, and then I'm supposed to say, then I'm kicking this over to Brad because he's been waiting. I know what you mean. There was a poem that got inspired by a drive on the way home from the state capital of Missouri. Um, I took the very long way, which is Highway 94, as a very windy route where I was at and I round this bend and I literally had to stop slam on the brakes put my car in reverse and relook at this because <laughs> picture this if you will and I wrote a poem about this inspired the poem picture if you will an old old church colonial maybe pre-civil war time period somewhere between that it got built 
And in front of this, front of this, there is a path that winds from the street to the church, and the path goes through the cemetery. But that's not enough. That's not enough. In front of that, next to the road, is a lighted sign with an arrow pointing to the church saying, Blood Drive Today. <laughs> <laughs> Many, that made the perfect Halloween poem. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, so I do love the whole thing about observation because, to be perfectly honest, I would say that is probably my number one yes. tool as an author. Uh, I, I love to sit around and stare at uh, the rest of the world, um, whether that's people watching, whether that's listening in on conversation, whether that's, you know, just taking in nature or whatever. Observation is awesome. Uh, one of the things I was going to throw out, for me right now, um, I, I guess I'm in flow. Uh, would be the easiest way of putting this in terms of our... Uh, because for right now, I'm not on autopilot or anything like that, but I'm having the time of my life because I've already finished the one series and uh, once contracts are up and everything, I'd love to go back and do more with that once I get the rights reverted back to me and stuff. Um, but I have a kid series that is middle grade. It's for 10-year-olds and up. And uh, it is fantasy and steampunk. So... Uh, it's very freeing, and I can do whatever I want, and I get to, it's my sandbox where I get to play. Uh, but because of that, um, I am writing for kids a lot, which means that um, at some point during the day, uh, the adult in me wants to have an adult conversation and do adult things. Oh. And there we go. <laughs> Not those kinds of adult things on the page. Keep getting my hopes up about this adult business. It's that not that kind of adult. It's just for people older than ten. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, because of that, uh, and that's where Tales of the Gearblade comes in, and that's where I get to have like more fun and everything like that. So for right now, writing very much is um, if I'm not playing in one world, then I get to go and play in the other world that's exactly opposite from the world that I'm playing in. So. It's it's very fun and it's it's I'm the storylines I know they're going, um, so it's really much about being a content creator and just kind of creating the worlds and the stories and having a lot of fun doing that. So for right now, that is really cool. However, even that all is not enough because for some reason time is creepy right now and. Uh, I'm working on the History of St. Louis Writers Guild, which is a very important project that I've been working on for almost a decade now. There will be two God. volumes. There will be the one that's published while he's alive and the one that's published after we're all dead. Exactly. The <laughs> one that gets locked away to be published long after I'm gone. Um, but the, uh, Can't sue the dead for libel. Yeah, exactly. After everyone else in the book's dead, too. That's, that's a good point. But, you know, that, that's, been in, it, that's been one. And then the other thing that I'm doing is finally writing... Uh, a project that I have been mulling about for a really long time. It's a project I first wrote in college, and now I'm going to turn it into a book. Um, and so because of that, but that is completely different. And so what I'm getting at with all of this is that one of the things that I love about being a writer and one of the things I love about imagination is being able to stretch it into areas that I don't necessarily feel comfortable with. Like... I very clearly have a steampunk sandbox mm -hmm. that I feel very comfortable playing in and throwing out into the world. Uh, Nonfiction is an entirely different world for that, and then uh, literary family drama type stuff is an entirely new avenue to walk down. Uh, but for me, it's all writing, it's all my writer brain, and it's just the ability to explore other areas that I don't necessarily get to explore. Mm -hmm. and. I've never really been one to write the multi-project thing, and we'll see how long this really... I have a feeling this will last until they get of a certain size, and then I will want to finish them and lock in and do that. Mm -hmm. But for right now, I'm working on four different projects. Wow. Uh, and literally, uh, I just pick days, and I have different work schedules during that day. So, like, morning will be devoted to one, the evening will be devoted to another, and then, mm -hmm. you know... I switch out the days that won't continue but it's been an interesting thing to really kind of ex expand on my imagination and on my writing craft uh, I, I don't know if I recommend it to anyone else but it has been an intriguing kind of journey well I know JK Rowling does something like that that's how we ended up with, J with Harry Potter well and the fact that they're all different has I mean if they were similar mm -hmm. I don't think I could do this 
So, any final thoughts on this joy? Because we're almost at the hour mark. I do have one thing I'm going to say, but I'm going to leave it to the end. Go, go ahead. So, we mentioned earlier that um, the world around us is not always supportive of writers. And I wanted to, to ask what, well, I think it might be helpful if we came up to some ans- with some answers to one of the things that gets slung at writers often when we're like, I want to write, I want to do this thing. And people are like, hmm. Like, what do you say to people when, like, when they say people don't want to read the kind of things, the kinds of things you like? Mm. Like, nobody's interested in what you have to say. Like, how do you even come back from that? Well, uh, Ryan's beating me to that one, so go ahead, Ryan. I just say BS, because there's always somebody out there that wants to read it. Um, I, I, I've, I've lived in a very diverse, uh, different realms, uh, everything from Portland, Oregon, to Albuquerque, New Mexico, to Moberly, to to, to a couple of the places, but there's always people out there that want to read something new, especially if you're being, I don't know, honest and legitimate and skillful and passionate and talented as best you can. Um, I worked for a, a, a group kind of like American Pickers out of uh, a place nearby where I live here called The Greenery. People would drive with a flatbed from like Texas and like Michigan and fill it with a whole bunch of random junk. They would spend thousands of dollars on stuff. And if if some random person can drive from Northern Michigan or like Southern Texas to like Payson, Illinois, somebody out there wants to read your stuff. I agree. And you really, there's always gonna be naysayers to everything you do. There's going to be people who can't see what you what you are doing, what your dream is, what you want to achieve. Probably my favorite one of those people was my own father, who I think I've shared the story multiple times before, so I'll keep it short. Supported me in everything but the writing. And I remember still on one backpacking trip in Philmont, New Mexico, as I'm sitting writing a, writing a story in a notebook. Now let me explain something. You're backpacking. That means you carry everything in. Every ounce matters. (laughs) And with me, I always had at least one to two paperback novels and something to write with. And he he turned. I don't know. I don't even remember who who he was talking to because I was in a hammock writing. That was the other thing I made sure I carried. Um, And he said, "Yeah, my son thinks he's a writer." And this was after I had already published some poet poetry. So you have to keep going. You have to you can either go, okay, I accept the naysayers, or I'm going to show you I can do otherwise. And with that I think there is one person that you have to please and that's you. Yep. Mm-hmm. If you do that, you're a success. Yeah, right. Write for yourself. Seriously. The writing against parental angst, that's a good one too. Yes, it is. <laughs> And on that note, blow up everything that's blocking you from getting your writing out there. It, you have a love, you have a passion, and if you believe in God, or if you believe in the universe, or you just believe that in evolution, I don't care, somehow something gave you a gift, a talent, and not to use it is a waste. And on that note, have a great week writing. Tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Thank you for listening. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.